right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golan from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from sunny blue sky San Diego. And today I am joined by David Grebo, who is best-selling author, international speaker and the CEO of Knowledge Star. How are you doing, David? Great, thanks, John. And I presume the skies are equally blue up in San Francisco? Skies are equally blue up here, yes, they are. We, we, share, we share the same weather. Exactly. Well, let's we we probably sometimes a little bit better, but hey, who's who's splitting hairs? Um, I'll go for different instead of better. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. All right. So David uh, is already the author of two books, but he has a new book coming out uh, in May. I think you said, David, uh, called yes. Safe Selling. Safe Selling: Hitting a Home Run When You Sell in the Knowledge Economy. So. Uh, David, number one, what prompted you to write this book and, and why do you, and start to uncover for me why you think the differences in selling in a knowledge economy, what, what has occurred and what is going to occur? It, it's a great question, John. It, it came out of my research in my, in my last book, which was Minds at Work. Mm -hmm. I spent 35 years at IBM researching the impact of technology on the way we run our businesses. Right. And what I found out, I was looking at the Bureau of Labor Statistics for the 1980s. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to spend an interesting Saturday night, take a look <laughs> at the Worldwide Bureau of Labor Statistics for the 1980s. And what I found is that we went through this profound structural change in the 1980s. We went from 200 years of learning how to run a business in the industrial economy to a very brand new style of running a business in what we call the knowledge economy. And we basically switched from learning how to manage people's hands mm -hmm. to learning how to manage their minds. The, the problem was that the MBA programs and on the job training for managers, and I'll get to salespeople in a minute, but on the right. job training for managers was the old way of how to do business. In other words, they learned how to manage for 200 years and as we switched economies and began to move forward in the knowledge economy, they kept managing in the old way. They were using mm -hmm. 20th century procedures and policies and approaches to solve 21st century problems. What I realized is that that's also true for everybody else in the organization, including salespeople. Mm -hmm. So I started my second book and what I realized very quickly, we are one fifth of the way through the 21st century. We're 20 years into it. Okay. I know. So isn't it, isn't it isn't it crazy, especially for um, you know, people of my generation or your generation? It's funny because I just thought the other day somebody said, Oh, that was in nineteen ninety-eight, and I gone, Oh yeah, well that's not that long ago. And then you suddenly go, Oh my goodness, that is a long time ago. It's it's more behind us than in front of us for yeah. folks our age, that's for sure. Yeah. And um, to your and to your and to your point then, um, and I guess we have, you know, we came into we came into this century, and a lot of things have changed and continue to evolve, um, and and we've never really, I guess, most of us taken a, a step back and sort of looked at the broader picture of how we all need to evolve. We kind of just kind of react, don't we? Well, we we have to, you know. Bill Gates, who's a friend of mine, actually said that change, the speed of change is changing. It's moving faster mm. than ever before. Uh, I was on the phone with a friend of mine yesterday, and she slipped and she said, well, we're at the end of March. I said, no, we're at the end of February. <laughs> and she said, well, the last two weeks have felt like two months. Yeah. Uh, and the point she was making is that things, I mean, you cannot turn on the news today without suddenly feeling overwhelmed by the end of the day, by the amount of things that are happening. And that's just in one small section of what's going on in the world. If you take a look at technology, if you take a look at anything else, things are moving so quickly that we don't have time to take that step back. Okay. Yeah, and I guess that's and I guess that's part of the problem, though, is that that when when people naturally when humans get overwhelmed, the natural reaction is to kind of shut down, right, and kind of retreat to tried and tested and things that feel familiar and safe. Right. Well, they, we have a default, and the default is what we've done before that mm -hmm. worked. We'll just continue doing because we're not sure that the new thing will work. The problem is if you if you take a look at managers, for example, who in my first book were managing 
the same way they had managed for 200 years in the industrial mm -hmm. economy, okay? Yeah. A lot of the companies that were using that model of management were going out of business. They were just not successful anymore. If you take a look at all the companies that are folding, you suddenly start to ask a question, and that is, well, why did these companies do great for 30, 40, 50, 60 years, and suddenly in the last 10, 15 years, they're going out of business? And the reason is, one of the primary reasons is that the way they're managing people is they're still managing people as if they're working with their hands. Right. They're not managing people as if they're working with their minds. I was at a conference in Paris, and I had about 800 people in the audience, and I, and I said to them, how many people here are working with their hands? Raise your hand. There wasn't mm -hmm. a hand that went up. Right. <laughs> because <laughs> nobody at the end of the week does something with their hands anymore. I know you don't, I don't, most mm -hmm. of the people I meet don't. And I guess, and I guess this is part of the the challenge, isn't it? Because when somebody works with their hands, it's 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 very simple to see the tangible outcome normally, right? Yes. When somebody works with their mind, number one, all our minds work in very different ways, right? I mean, you know, there's similarities, but there's a lot of differences, and so how how one person works is how another and the output of one output of another it's all it's it's all there's so many variables that it, as it becomes overwhelming as we just said a moment ago to even manage right it does it's it's incredibly difficult and, and the same is true for selling the funny thing is people aren't born consumers and that doesn't mm -hmm. matter whether it's an individual like you or i or somebody who's running a large corporation and making a large corporate purchase. As a consumer, we learn how to consume, okay? Mm -hmm. One of the great teachers in the last 15, 20 years has been Amazon, for example. Sure. And the Amazon model has become the model for the way people are learning to buy. The book I'm working on right now that's coming out in May makes the point that Amazon does three things extremely well. And if you want to be aligned with today's consumer, the way people have learned to buy, you have to do exactly what Amazon does. And the three things they do really well is they tell a story that's a very compelling story. They rate their products, and usually an A rating is the best you can get. So you have mm -hmm. stories, you have A ratings, and then you have what I call frictionless experiences. A frictionless experience was developed when... Uh, user interface designers, user experience designers who did websites tried to figure out the easiest, quickest way for you to get what you want. And they called that frictionless. In mm -hmm. other words, if it, took you, if it took you a number of screens and lots of clicks and lots of messages coming up telling you what to do, after a while, there was too much friction between where you wanted to be and where you wanted to get to, okay? So they started to model things in, in a way that they call frictionless, and suddenly everything now is frictionless. You find that people are trying to make it as easy as possible to get from A to B, from the mm -hmm. beginning of needing something to not only just buying it, but well down the road. And that's the interesting thing about that A rating. If you look at Amazon, people rate products well past the point of purchase. Oh, yeah. So to get an A rating, which is what you want, because if you don't get that A rating, someone else will. To get that A rating, you have to be on your A game for the life cycle of that product or that mm -hmm. service. So safe selling talks about those three big elements. The S stands for being able to tell a compelling story, which is not that easy. It's, it, mm -hmm. A compelling story, if you look at, a, at an Amazon, for example, it's not a case study. A case study is a very dry academic non-dramatic, very unemotional. You know, I used to write case studies for IBM. Mm -hmm. and if I got very emotional or if I started to use quotes or quotations, they were instantly gone. Okay? <laughs> well, a good compelling story has those dramatic elements. And you can tell yeah. that story to somebody who's buying something that you'd like to sell them. The A in safe selling stands for that A rating. You want to get that A rating. And you have to realize that that A rating happens because other people will rate you and many people will read that. It's almost as if social media has become part of your sales cycle. Oh, yeah, absolutely. The frictionless experience is the FE, okay? So if you take the S and the A and the FE, that's the safe and safe selling. And if you put that all together, what you realize that you're doing is that you're, you're aligned with the way people are learning to buy things. You're not selling in the 20th century model. 
you're selling in the 21st century. Yeah, and it's and it's interesting, David, because I see a lot of companies, um, obviously, who are attempting to do this. And the the important point that I want to underline in what you said there is the is the life the lifespan of the experience, right? So there's a lot of companies where you can have a really easy and frictionless buying experience. But afterwards, your your experience as a customer is full of friction, right? And suddenly they go from making it really easy for you to buy to making it really difficult for you to talk to them, right? And and so to your point though, if you're going to have if you're going to really win, you have to look at the totality of the customer experience, not just the buying experience. Well, you you I absolutely agree with John. You have to look at the totality and you have to look at something else. You have to realize that it's not just the customer you've sold to that's important. Yeah. It's the entire, it's all of the network of customers that you've sold to. And the reason mm-hmm. is they talk to each other. Yeah. And they talk to each other and they tell each other the good things as well as the bad things. And they share about the product and the service to the point that they never have been able to before. Mm-hmm. And if you don't start to take that into account in terms of the way you sell, you're missing a huge piece of the equation. No, absolutely. And I, and again, I think it, it's a good thing to underline as well what you just said. I mean, and Amazon's a great, a great example is if you do go and read reviews, you can see people reviewing a product they bought a year ago. You can see somebody coming back and updating a, a, a review, right? um, oh, you know, for great. better or for worse. Yeah. Well, so Yelp, is, your, Yelp is another good channel yeah. too. Mm-hmm. Yelp is a channel where you can not only, you can say something about the product or the service, but then the person providing the product or the service can come back and say to you, well, I'll be in touch, or I'm sorry mm-hmm. that happened, or we'll do something to fix it. And then that person can come back and say, well, they did get in touch and they did fix it. And that's the story. That's part of that compelling story that you can tell about the product or service. So how can um, where, where's a good starting point for uh, for companies or even people, as we said, even salespeople themselves as individuals? What's a good starting point to maybe look at how you're operating today and make some at least baby steps towards operating in a different mode? I've found that, the and I've given a few workshops, and the the answers Mm -hmm. that have come back to me is that people have to stop and start to reflect on what they're doing. They have to see if they're selling the way they were taught to sell 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago, and if that's their default, when they get into a sales situation, they go into all the things that they used to do, Mm -hmm. or if they start to think about the way the consumer has relearned in a way to buy things, products and services, and if they're aligned with what the consumer has learned. You know, if you learn, if you learn English and I try to sell to you in French, Mm -hmm. we're not going to get very far. Okay. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I have to, I have to understand what you learned and I have to speak that language. In a sense, what I'm trying to get people to do is understand their language of selling, okay? And is their language of selling the right language for the language of buying? Are you really communicating? If you still think that your customer or your consumer is someone who doesn't talk to other people or read other reviews, uh, doesn't really care about your story in terms of your product or your service and isn't compelled to buy, um, if you have made your experience less than frictionless, you're basically going to be beaten by the competition because mm-hmm. the competition will take advantage of the fact that they understand what the modern consumer is all about and they'll play to that. Yeah, and I think the, the and, and another great, great point that you've raised there is the idea that um, uh, in, in all honesty, I mean, a lot of things that are sold today are perceived as commodities anyway by consumers, whether whether they are or not is beside the point, you know, they're perceived. As, so often the experience is the only way that you can really, or one of the few ways that you can at least initially differentiate yourself. Um, so to your point, if you have friction in your process, if you're still trying to operate in an old way, um, you're 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 removing the one area that you can really differentiate yourself. Well, the word "free" is something that's become part of the vocabulary for products and services these days, especially mm-hmm. for products. Mm-hmm. There's a, there's a commercial that I saw a couple of days ago on the TV, and it was, I won't mention the product, but they kept mentioning the word "free," free, 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 free. It's all about free. Oh, well, free makes 
the buying of something relatively frictionless when it comes to the, the delivery, okay? Free mm-hmm. delivery. Uh, it doesn't cost you anything once you buy it to get it. It's free delivery. But what you find on the other side is that it costs you $19.47 to return it. Yeah. So it's not really free, okay? <laughs> and, and that's, for example, why the Amazon model, again, is a good one. The Amazon model is if you don't like it for whatever reason, you print out that return label, you slap it on the same box, you drop it off at the post office, and it's history. It's done. It's out of your yeah. life. That's frictionless, and that's the life cycle of that buy. Okay? Yeah. So uh, in terms of baby steps, one of the things I tell people to look at is, for example, are you doing any of the three elements that count? Are you telling a good story? Um, and and the good story involves the dramatic elements. It's not the case study. It's not dry. It's very emotional. It's very exciting. It's as exciting as you can possibly make it. Um, are you getting good ratings from people and not just for the immediate buy, but down the line for the service that you provide for the product or for the service itself over time. Um, I recently had a service person check in with me three, six, and nine months after I used that okay. service. I wrote that person a great review on Yelp, and then I noticed that there were other people who were writing the same thing, that they checked in, they followed up, they were there, they were there when they were needed. So I ask them to look at that, and then finally I tell them, you can make, you can try to at least find where the friction is in the process, okay? If you can start to reduce that friction, you'll find a tremendous difference in the way people respond to your selling. Um, yeah. So there are small and, steps they can take. Yeah, and let's face it, uh, David, as you know, there's nothing that we like better as humans than to be able to recommend something to somebody else. It makes us feel good, right? It makes, oh, David, David, you're looking for that. Well, guess what? Uh, I got one and it was fantastic and the service was great. Oh, we love that. It makes us feel good. So we have to, f- I mean, it makes sense to empower people, your, your customers, to be able to be evangelists for you. Well, I, I agree with you and I would only take it one step further and that is, the customers are already empowered. Mm-hmm. So your your job is to help them use that power to your advantage True. in the service of your product or your service. Yeah, no, that's a good, that's a that's an excellent correction of it. Because yes, you're right, they already have the power, but you, you want them to use it on your behalf instead of yes. somebody else's. Yeah. <laughs> excellent. So, um, David, uh, before we finish up, you said the book is uh, coming out in May? Yes. Okay, well, all of David's information linked to his book uh, will be here. Plus, when the book is released, um, we'll feature it as well. And David, hopefully when the book uh, comes out, you'll come back and chat with us again and we can go a little deeper even. I'd like that. I'd like that a lot, John. That'd be great. Thank you. Excellent. All right, David, thank you very much for joining me today. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. I'll see you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks, John.